uh, you can't guarantee that you'll be the you'll be the most talented person in the room, but you can guarantee that you'll be the most uh, hard worker. There's always a way for you to learn and improve and to get better. So, and, and I, I truly believe that hard work beats talent because uh, it, it's it's the mindset and the drive, you know. How can brands break through the noise and create a lasting impact in today's world? What does it take to challenge the status quo and harness creativity as a catalyst for positive change? Well, we're here to find out. Welcome to the Design Rush podcast, where we bring you game changers and innovators who can help drive your business forward. I'm your host and senior editor at Design Rush, Bianca Mayer. Today, we have the privilege of diving into the minds of two extraordinary individuals leading the way in this transformative movement. Joining us are the founders and executive creative directors of AKQA Bloom, an agency that's been making waves with its fearless approach, inspiring brands to make a difference. Please welcome to the show the rising stars in advertising, Jean Zamprogno and Fernando Lazaro. So, Fernando, I'd really like to start with you, actually. Um, you grew up, I read, with a public school teacher dad and a hairdresser mom. How do you think this mix of education and creativity influenced your approach to advertising today? Wow, <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> thank, thank you for that. I don't think no one ever asked me that, but uh, I think uh, both, both Zump and I, uh, we come from very kind of humble backgrounds, you know, not like traditional big families or so um, uh, I think that played a big role on who we are and the paths we decided to our careers. Um, we mostly with that um, hard work drive, you know, um, we never, I, I, sometimes we have been working together for so long that sometimes we speak for both of us, but um, in a sense, like um, we never consider ourselves really talented people. We definitely, but our talent is is working extremely hard, and that's why we achieve what we achieve, you know. And I yeah. think um, that, that that came along really, really uh, strong with the parents that I had. Uh, my dad being a public school, school teacher of Portuguese, so that made me read a lot, and eventually. I, I don't know if that was natural, but I became a copywriter, you know, maybe maybe that played a, a big role uh, on that decision. And definitely my mom um, uh, being more like a kind of free spirit, like uh, with crazy ideas, you know, like I think I, I inherited a bunch of that uh, fr from her. But I think the, the biggest learning uh, from my parents is, uh, uh, is to work hard uh, and and do everything with care and love, you know, uh, to, to succeed. And I think they, they are very proud uh, on that sense. I think that's the, the biggest lesson I, I took from them. So that's quite fascinating to hear, actually. So um, given that, what were some of the key moments or experiences that led you to become one of the most awarded creative directors in the world? Did that play a big part in it, do you think? Were there other key components? I think what Zara just mentioned um, is really important, like professionally and, and personally. You know, I also come from a background that you know my my dad is a singer, and, and my mom at some my mom at some point she had like a small bride shop. You know, and and then um, it comes from the sense of responsibility with the effort they were putting on our uh, education and the little bit they could save. Uh, we we needed to honor that, you know, I remember when I was like 18 years old, uh, when I was like finally able to make my first uh, international trip uh, to London to 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 learn and, and work a little bit that uh, it was more like I need to honor that, you know, and uh, I think everything else is pretty much of a consequence of it. And then um, as we evolved on our careers, um, when we arrived at this, it was, you know, advertising was pretty much about, for us at least, was like this idea of one day being famous or winning awards and traveling the world and everything. And, and then at some point we just realized that um, what if we infuse our values and the things we believe on it and we use this as a 
form of um, expression, you know, and then suddenly we were in a place like working for big brands uh, still in Brazil at a time like Coca-Cola, for example. And we just saw that, okay, if we if we want to to make it uh, to the awards and to, you know, like this um, place that we are envisioning, we need to play in the culture. You know, we, need, we don't need to to sell uh, burgers uh, flying and flipping or drinking shots or anything like that. We need to to use the, the, the brand's speakers and voices and cultural influence to, to build culture and not just like be part of it, you know? And then uh, I think our very first big impact uh, in this space was uh, the campaign The Scopes of Fanta when we realized that, okay, there is an expression here in Brazil that since our childhood is being used and we kind of normalized this because it was normal uh, uh, to hear that, you know, like it was also like a bullying kind of um, space, like this Coke Zafanta was a homophobic expression used uh, towards the, like, like um, you know, the, the queer population. And then uh, it's, it's crazy that um, it was so normalized at some point, and then we were like in this transformation of, of you know, like trying to understand you know, how bad it is and the impact and, and everything. And then we came up with this idea of putting Fanta inside of Coca-Cola and, and kind of call this out, like saying like this Coke's a Fanta, so what, you know? And then suddenly the, the, the repercussion of this campaign in Brazil was amazing. Uh, like in one or two days, everyone was talking about this and we ended up being able to actually flip the the expression from something negative to something positive. Uh, Google uh, proved it. Uh, it was a, a really great impact to us. And then we even saw the expression being born in different countries as something positive. And then we were like, okay, okay, maybe we can do this more and more for different brands and, you know, expressing our, our values. And then I think this first moment and everything that came after this brought us to 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 this uh idea of okay what if we can you know bring our our values and the things we believe you know exactly um you know it's so crazy gene that you brought that up because i was going to bring up uh it's a coke <laughs> Fanta, right? That's how you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So a Coke is a Fanta. I was going to bring that up because I saw that. Uh, I think you did a presentation for it somewhere. I'm not 100 percent sure where, but I was going to bring that up because I saw that and I literally had goosebumps for how incredible that campaign was. I mean, wow. That that is so creative in the first place, and in the second place, it just created such a huge impact. Um, I was going to get to this a little bit later in the <laughs> in the chat, but uh, you know, on that note, now that we're here, um, was there any you know time or any recent uh, ads that you might have done for bigger brands that had a similar um, reaction in society? Mm. Uh, this Cox of Fanta was a uh, kind of benchmark in our careers, you know, like uh, I think that that set a new path uh, for us e uh, leading up to what we are doing right now, because we finally understood um, that we could use the reach uh, and the scale of the brands to do actually something good for society or, or the environment, in this case for society, right, with this Cox of Fanta. And, and we started to, to try to push that more and more proactively and of course sometimes we did receive briefs uh, to be culturally relevant and to play a role in, 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 in society for many brands but most of the time we were uh, pushing our clients to do so. I don't think we can actually compare the, the, the kind of impact but the, but the sentiment I think it's, it, it's important which is the Not Co campaign we just launched with uh, picturing old animals. Uh, I'm not sure if you saw this one but like uh, basically, um, not, not many people discuss about that, but the lifespan of animals in the industry and their natural lifespan is massive. Uh, there's a massive difference between them. Um, and then we saw this opportunity to um, picture these old animals created by AI, just like Notco use AI to create their food. We asked AI to imagine how these animals would look like if they live uh, a full life expectancy. Uh, and then we recently did this campaign and I, we, we feel that it, it 
resonated to a lot of people. A lot of people started questioning themselves, oh, I actually never saw an old pig or an old cow in my life because those animals, they are, they are born with a lifespan. Most of the time with a couple of months or even days, chickens like they live 47 days in the US. So, and I think if you see the comments on the campaign, I think um, uh, that's the kind of reaction we want. Like it's people truly stopping and thinking about something, you know, uh, and I think we kind of generated that with this campaign as well. Yeah, and I think sort of the, the, um, the magic comes when we are able to understand that um, in the end of the day, we are, uh, you know, we are working to sell product and ser products and services and we need to build these uh, stories most of the time around the products and, and, and brands, you know, and I think the some sometimes the secret sauce is to build the narrative with the product or brand at the center, you know, like this Coca Fanta is a great example because the idea is the product and here when it comes to not co the the brand and, and the use of AI in the narrative, you know, because not co uses AI to find uh, to analyze food in a molecular level so they can Uh, replicate the the texture, the flavor, and all the properties of the food, um, but with plant ba uh, plant based food instead. And when we bring AI as a solution for that, I think this this is the nuance that changes everything. And over the years, we were able to kind of build this this skill of uh, you know bringing the product and brand uh, to the center of narrative uh, of the narrative. You know, I think. Moldy Whopper is another great example. Like I think, pretty much of um, um, our main ideas, maybe the most awarded ones, the most recognized ones, are the ones that you see in the keyframe, key the the product there. You know, exactly. Um, it's so interesting that you guys are bringing up AI because I think every podcast I've done since we started, every single person mm -hmm. we've we've spoken to has brought up AI somehow in their industry. And seeing as we're there now too, um, can we maybe find out what do you guys foresee AI? I mean, you've obviously explained how it helped you in this campaign, but how do you see it impacting the advertising industry going forward? We, we discuss a lot about AI, but like, I don't think there's a consensus, you know, about the impact that AI will actually have um, uh, in our industry. Um, what I do think is that um, we should use these new tools in, in the best way possible, you know, like in, in our favor. Um, so, for example, uh, in this campaign, uh, using AI was part of the narrative because Notco uses AI uh, to create their food, like to generate recipes, to analyze combinations, just like Zampa was mentioning. Um, so using AI to imagine these old animals was really connected to the narrative of the brand. So we, we try to avoid the use of the AI for the sake of the use of AI, you know. Um, we, in, in our case, we use it because it helped uh, building the story. And I, and I think we people should kind of have that filter too, you know, like it's using it when it makes sense. Um, of course, taking advantage of these, these tools like chat GPT, there's so much for us to learn and like in, and sometimes save time, but like that doesn't actually replace, I don't think it does replace the creative work. For me, it's, it's pretty much like one of the uh, most impressive milestones in humanity. We, like we are uh, in humanity, we are like realizing this, you know, like, In the end of the day, it's not too different from, you know, fire or electricity or internet. You know, AI is one of these big milestones. And just like um, the, 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 the ones that I just mentioned, it will be used for the good and the bad, you know. And yeah. we, need to, uh, we need to try to build the ways for these to be used uh, in, in the best ways we can and try to mitigate and, and avoid the, the bad intentions behind it. And uh, uh, I think the same way internet was used for the good and the bad and, and generated a lot of solutions and also a lot of problems, it will be yeah. maybe in an even bigger scale with AI. And um, I think 
right now we are trying to digest and, and understand all the players that are going in a really really interesting direction that we can partner with them i think we have some um upcoming clients uh, on, on this space here that we can talk a little bit uh, about then but um it's it's just um it's a very complicated issue and we need to jump uh, on this as fast as we can and and you know uh trying to use this yeah. to be a force of good you know it's it's the it's like communication and advertising imagine every advertising as a tool we can also use for the good and the bad and the yeah. advertising cr created this basically created the cigarette industry like uh, uh helping people to develop a bad habit uh so it was clearly a powerful tool we had in our hands use it for the bad you know um and with ai is, is exactly the same thing so i couldn't agree more i just wanted to do this parallel between communications as a tool like like advertising is um with ai so we just want to to make sure we are using it for good exactly it's you know it's basically setting up ethical parameters around it so that you can be using it safely and that it actually yeah. has good impact on society as opposed to having a negative one i completely understand yeah. and i couldn't agree more either um yeah i think that's that's it's it's going to be interesting to see how it actually develops in the next say year two years i think it's going to be quite interesting um and definitely a learning curve as you mentioned so okay i'd like to get a little bit more back to your your personal lives a little bit or more of your personal um accomplishments so far um so basically i know that Jean, you were uh the you have extensive experience as an executive creative director across in different countries you you've had international acclaim with with things that you've done um so how has your international background influenced your creative approach to the advertising industry would you say yeah i think um this industry or any other creative industry is all about uh a, a diversity of experiences and and being able to experience um from argentina to portugal to london to brazil and uh you know seven years in the us now i think it's super important that um we understand how rich it is and we try to bring it to to what we are building here you know like sometimes we even um you know talk that that we are building like a like a visa agency here in a sense because we're bringing a lot of people from different backgrounds but i think it's also important to understand uh what unite us you know in a sense of yes we are trying to bring uh, like people from all over the world uh but we also need to have like this sense of where they are looking for the same solutions you know what is the what is the thing that unites everyone like this vision that we we can do something better in our careers in our in our lives and this combined with the diversity of backgrounds like we all we we are all aligned in the problems and that we want to solve them but it's important to have like this very diverse um angles of bringing the solutions you know So this is more of a question for both of you. Um you both have been recognized by Business Insider as one of the 30 under 30 rising stars revolutionizing advertising. So how has that recognition impacted your career and what advice would you give to other young professionals aspiring to make like a significant impact in the ad industry? Uh maybe Fernando we can start with you. Yeah. Um I get the hard the hard ones. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. No, that, that 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 that's a good question. Um uh I don't I don't think we see lists uh much different than uh than awards, you know. Um it's it it's again it's a, it's another recognition that helps to reinforce that what we are doing is right and that we are in the right path and and doing the right thing. So it's really reassuring and I think that sentiment's extremely important because sometimes like to achieve what we achieve and many people um are doing like there's a lot of hard work behind and a, a lot of um 
time and effort, you know. Um, so um, we saw many people throughout our careers like leaving advertising along their way because it, it can be a really tough career, you know, like long hours of work, extremely demanding mentally yeah. and physically, you know. Um, but um, I think it's just being being featured in one of those lists is, is it it just reinforces and, and gives more um, drive to keep going, you know, and, and keep pushing. And, and also um, that um, the path that we are choosing is correct, you know. If we are being recognized for that, it means something. So uh, for the past, uh, let's say, uh, seven years, eight years, we have been pushing extremely hard for social impact and environmental impact ideas. You can see that a lot across many campaigns that we did. This industry we work is so tough that sometimes I feel like we have invented like this uh, system as an industry of uh, the awards and lists and everything um, because it can be some sort of uh, mermaid um, singing, you know, like we can go uh, too deep on this and it pollutes a, a little bit of the, the ego and the ways it, it works because sometimes I feel like it's very... Um, it comes from a, an ego or white male patriarchy uh, system, in a sense, you know, that uh, I, I've seen people going way too deep on, on this and making this all about this and all about them, you know. And I, I think it's important to recognize that the work needs to come first. And, and if you have like this drive of um, doing something better for the industry for society and the environment and if you want to put these things that are in your in your heart on a on a paper and translate them into ideas that will influence people and 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 the industry as a whole eventually the recognition will come uh in awards in the lists and everything but um sometimes i feel like there is a flip of uh priorities you know it's all about this, and I think it's it's important uh, for us to to analyze this sometimes and, and and consider what we are building as an industry. You know, I do think that it is an incredible achievement for both of you, and it's okay to pat yourselves on the back for that too. You know, uh, I understand that you're saying that you know the priorities and everything comes first when it comes to working and putting the work in, and the recognition comes later. That's exactly what you did, and you did get that recognition, and it's incredible. It's an incredible feat. I'm, I personally am very proud of you guys. So I just met you. It's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I, I just want to uh, add something, Bianca, if I may. Uh, it's it, it, it'll be quick. Um, sure. It's um, many many of the ideas we did. Um, they, they took us many years to, to implement, you know, like uh, such as Discox event. I took uh, more than three years for us to actually make it uh, uh, module upper over four or five years, you know. So um, I, I think um, we we never saw uh, the award in the awards as uh, as the goal, but the consequence, you know. Um, and we were pushing extremely hard to make stuff that we believe. Because it's super easy to give up, like after one, two years that you can't sell an idea or you can't bring it to life, you just say, F it, I won't do it anymore, you know, but Next. Like, when, you know, <laughs> when you know it's right, you keep pushing for it and you keep investing your time and energy uh, to, to bring it to life. And a lot of the ideas we, we did, uh, they took many, many, many years. And of course, um, as Zampa was saying, like, uh, I, I, I think the results of getting so many awards whereas actually because we saw it as just the consequence and not the, the goal we are focusing on on building something right uh, with the right message with the right insight with the right impact for people uh, and, and and the award things it's a consequence and, it, and it's again people playing the industry to get recognition and and to be seen well i think this is the talent you were mentioning at the beginning you know like going back to this like i, I think our talent is what differentiates us a little bit more i would say is like this the resilience over some ideas that sometimes you just see people saying like why don't you just give up on this you know and then we just keep going until 
um, we, we get it done, you know, I think, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, from both of you, it sounds like the award definitely went to the right people <laughs> because it sounds like you guys really put the hard work in. So uh, I don't think they, I think it's a, it's a good thing. So, okay, enough about that. Let's talk a little bit more about your AKQA Bloom partnership. So what was it that led you to transition from your roles as executive creative directors at David Miami to launching AKQA Bloom? It's crazy to see when you look backwards and then you see when things start uh, being born and take shape, you know, like, and, and for us, as we mentioned, I think it, um, this sentiment really, really flourished and, and it started when we did this called Safanta and we saw the impact that company had. Um, uh, it really, really resonated to us uh, and it just opened our minds even more to show, oh, we should do more of this, you know, like we should use this power and reach of the brand that I was mentioning uh, to do something good and positive, you know. Um, we know brands, they have all kinds of issues, like, you know, but like they, they, they can all play um, a good role in, in some sense, you know, either social or environmental. So uh, after this Coca Fanta, we start doing more and more of this, pushing proactively a lot uh, for our clients to do this kind of ideas. We did many ideas for, for Budweiser as well, like during COVID, um, uh, blood donation ideas, vaccine ideas, like there are ma many examples. Um, and I think we got to a point uh, also after um, being recognized for these ideas and get this recognition from the industry that we, we basically stop it and ask ourselves, like, um, what should we do? Like, uh, uh, should we just keep doing more of the same? Or maybe we can we can focus 100% of our time in, on this path in this direction. I think... Um with the ideas we were selling proactively or because we built a reputation that uh, brought the clients to brief us in, in, a, in a certain way because they would know the outcome, I think we were able to buy the luxury of being working with these kinds of projects uh, more connected to social and, and, and environmental impact. I would say like for half of our time and that was a luxury because in this industry, it, it feels like it's it's the 10% of the work you do uh, for another reason or, or something like that. But we were in the point that we we were like so far on this, like, uh, like the percentage of the work was um, so good that made us think of, okay, if we could choose, what if we try to make it 100%, you know, what if, what if we try to make it all about this? not only the time but also the depth you know uh what if we build a machine that can help uh building the the future of these we know with more um with more substance and then we started having like these thoughts and uh we were in a point where we were being approached by networks and agencies and it really developed uh, on us like this feeling of what would we do if we could choose, you know? And then, um, you know, having conversations with close friends like Hugo and Diego and, and some other people, we just realized that a lot of people were connected to this and we were like throwing this on the universe and eventually something would happen. And then it just happened when Hugo and Diego came to us saying, guys, um, you need to talk to Ajaz because it feels like you're you are very much aligned uh, as as a vision with what uh, Ajaz is doing, and in the end of the day, we just realized that um, Ajaz saw like 25, 30 years ago. And by the way, Ajaz is the CEO and founder of AKQA. And 25, 30 years ago, he saw internet as um, not only a trend, but that platform that will, um, you know, merge all the channels and every media will converge to this, and this will be the the reality of the future. And he saw that when maybe some other people were seeing this as a trend or as something cool, you know. 
And then uh, suddenly we are in this place where everything is digital and there is no such a thing as a digital agency. And, and, and this is the this is the everything. And then uh, talking to Ajaz in the very first time, we just realized that the same vision he had like 30, 25 years ago, he has now with this thing called um, social and environmental impact. This is what will um, get the rights for the brands to operate in the future. You know, like there, there will be no way uh, a brand will operate just by selling their products and services. We need to have like a sense of, uh, you know, how the brands are mitigating their negative impact, how their brands are being a force of good beyond just the products and services. And then we just realized it really strongly that there will be no one else to do it um, besides uh, Ajaz. And then suddenly we were on this. And w one year after this, it, it's been just amazing how much we evolved and, and we have been learning on this. And we know that the creative output is coming already, will come more and more, but just the learning, you know, combine it with uh, me being a newborn dad too, and realizing that we are doing this for the generations to come. And, and this impact doesn't need to be just the, the creative output on the ideas. Maybe we can influence, um, you know, a generation to prove that it's possible to to work only with this, you know, to, to build something like this. So I think we are shifting our priorities to to build a platform so so the new generations can understand that we can work with this, you know. That is wonderful, honestly. <laughs> it's, it's so wonderful to hear. And it's, it's really nice that there are actually agencies such as yourselves, but mainly yourselves, that are actually trying to enact change through the incredible ads that you guys are putting out there. Um, it's inspiring. It's absolutely inspiring. So more on Bloom, what does it mean for Bloom to be an autonomous agency with AKQA? Uh, what we align it with um, Ajaz and, and what, what um, made us super excited about it is to have the creative freedom um, for the work, but also for the clients we work with, you know, like to, to get to choose um, without pressure from, from the network in, in any of those senses, you know, like we ultimately make the, the business uh, decisions of uh, who we're gonna work with and which path we are taking uh, Bloom as the concept, you know, as, as an agency. Of course, there are financial uh, support from, from the network and the background things, but the vision, um, uh, we have a lot of freedom to take it to where we, we think it, it should be. Um, and I think that that's what um, excites us a lot. Um, uh, um, they let us um, to, um, uh, to decide a lot of the work that we, we we we're currently doing and the work that will be done in the in the near future, and maybe I can quickly touch on that because um, at the beginning we had a lot of conversations on oh should we only work for those amazing brands that are doing everything right already such as Patagonia for example they don't even work with an agency but just using them as an as an example um, because it seems right but then we said oh they are already doing the right thing we should work with the problematic ones you know like and people who are struggling and have uh, somehow um, um, uh, uh, room for improvement so we basically open our business models to um, uh, doing what's purple social and environmental impact for big global brands uh, even though they are not necessarily born with a clear purpose on that sense uh, but also working and supporting uh, those uh, other brands who were born with a clear purpose and they need to grow and set an example and keep uh, uh, flourishing. I think this um, autonomous way of work um, brought us to a place where I think we started up a little bit afraid of this, maybe being a little bit too narrow and limited and, you know, um, but... 
to address this, we came up with a very hippie uh, business model that it's literally a yin yang, <laughs> where yeah. one part of the yin yang would be like, let's do the social and environmental part to those big global brands such as Coca Cola, Volvo, you know, like the um, Hauser Bush, like the 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 scale that also comes with the negative impact that eventually those uh, brands will cause and 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 how to address them in a big scale too and how to to make the the good things they are doing go mainstream you know like the solutions i think with coca-cola we we ended up uh, working on an amazing project and system that is called returnables uh, they have developed a, um, a bottle that is uh a returnable bottle up to be used 25 times and this avoid 25 single-use plastic bottles and this is a reality already in some markets in a very small scale and our mission is to make it big and, and to, to make it global and to change the the consumption habit you know like that would be amazing if in a five ten years uh, round we, we look back and 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 we realize that we could bring an impact with this. But the other part of the yin yang is um, let's be agents of the record of those brands that were born with a bigger, uh, with a bigger and, and, and better purpose, you know, from the beginning. And maybe they are in a point that can, you know, they can make their first global campaign. They can make their first Super Bowl. But I think this mix of uh, realities and scales and sizes is uh, solving the problem of scale and, and, and niches, you know, like I think we, we, we ended up proving in this first year that um, it's pretty open, you know, it's pretty much everything. And I think the, the list of clients and projects we are working right now is a reflection of these. And, and Zalo, if you can talk a little bit more about this range, you know, that goes from this to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if I just want to add something to the to the Coca Cola, um, we are actually getting new updated numbers. But for example, um, we are really close to uh, our partners at Oceana. They are an amazing NGO, uh, environmental related, and and they they gave us some data that, for example, increasing refillable bottles by just ten percent in coastal countries um, would keep up to 7.6 billion single-use plastic bottles entering the ocean every year. So that, that's the kind of uh, scale that we talk about when we, when, we, when we try to work. Okay, so let's work uh, for Coca-Cola with returnable bottles. Understanding that the, if they increase only by 10%, we'll prevent 7.6 billion single-use plastic, plastic bottles entering the ocean every year. That has a massive impact. So... Uh, we, we try to keep our minds open and understanding the bigger picture instead of being super narrow, you know? Uh, so that's that's one thing with these big global brands, as Ampo was mentioning. I think, um, like, the, the range of disciplines, you know, in industry is such amazing. Yeah. Right now we are working with an amazing tech company from the Silicon Valley that is uh, addressing, you know, the relationship that we ended up with, um, you know, uh, with our devices and... Uh, the, 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 the use of screen and, and you know, everything that, um, you know, the, the, the relationship that we evolved, you know, from our smartphones to screen addiction and everything. And it's just amazing to see, to look back and to see the, the variety of experiences, uh, you know, between the environment, between our relationship with tech, with uh, our fellow beings. And it's not narrow at all, you know. Um, just to also talk about a little bit more about what your agency is all about. From what I can tell, you look for collaborations with people who practice fearless creativity, among other things. So what does this phrase mean to you and how do you go about implementing it into your brand partnerships? Maybe, you, Fernando, you can start. We try to be surrounded by by. Uh, as Ampa was saying, uh, in a, answering another answer, uh, another question from you um, sure. about about the different backgrounds um, and having people with different visions and experiences, I think that plays a big role on what we do, especially not only on the creative side, 
but on the social impact and environmental impact aspect too. So um, I think um, we are trying to build this 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 team um, uh, with, with people from all around the world. We have people from Thailand, from South Africa, people from Brazil. Uh, uh, we relocated people in the U.S. from Chicago, from San Francisco. So we we, we are trying to to have this collective. Uh, of people with different walks of lives, different experiences, uh, and different visions to help us try to solve um, uh, the problems we face. You know, like because there are there are many uh, in many different um, a- aspects to it, and we don't know all the answers. Like um, we have a lot of experience on the advertising field, but we don't we don't have a, a lot of experience going deep in all social and environmental issues you know like uh, we go as as we learn uh, that's what also one of the reasons why uh, we brought our strategy director um, from the public sector like she worked uh, on with NGOs for the past 15 years with social and environmental ideas and and um, we don't see these in in any regular agencies you know people with this kind of background so that's also one of the reasons we try to be surrounded with people with knowledge to help us solving creative, creatively uh, the, the issues, you know. And then when it comes to clients, um, uh, I think that there is um, there is an intention of clients to do this kind of work, either because it speaks to them or because they feel the pressure to do so. Um, we are okay with that uh, as long as they do, you know, and, and they do yeah. what's right. Um, we, we always try to identify and, and, and help to and try to be the best partners to achieve their business results, but doing what we believe it's right uh, for society. And it's funny enough because on our credentials deck, we do have a slide that uh, a lot of the, uh, our most successful ideas, business wise, uh, were actually the ones we had some kind of impact in society or the, the environment. Um, and, and that translates to business results. And I think that's the that's the picture people need to see, and 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 the old, and, the, and that's the the waking up moment to oh I actually need to do that because it's not only the right thing it's a, it's also be- better for the business. But Zampa, feel free to yeah. To add and Zaro, I think we are also evolving our own narrative. You know, um, you know, starting from uh, what speaks to our hearts and careers. Um, uh, I I'm. I'm super comfortable saying that we started from this almost innocent place, you know. Yeah. But over a year now, we we've been realizing that it's it's not about, um, you know, being good for the sake of being good or um, yeah. partnering with clients that are also good people and want to do good. You know, it's it's a very much of a business. Um, approach to what we are trying to build here like uh, if we have if we if we help clients being ahead of the curve of um, you know like the, the business frontiers that um, more social and environmental work and the narratives and and the creative power around it what it can bring to the business is something that no programmatic or traditional storytelling will be ever able to to bring this business and, mar- and marketing results. And right now, talking to specialists, even talking to people from Wall Street about this and, 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 the, and the baggage behind, um, you know, everything that is the other side, we are just realizing that this is just like the best business approach that, that you can add, uh, you know, if you're a CMO or if you're a brand manager, like there is no other way to do this. Uh, looking for the business results, it's not just for the sake of being good and do good, you know. Exactly, it kind of all falls into place after your intentions are good. With all of that in place, obviously, you obviously need to strike a balance between like brand love and brand trust. So, how do you do that in these types of collaborations with brands? It's funny, like we we have been in the business for a little over sixteen years now, um, and throughout most of our career, we were talking about brand love. You know, uh, we are never talking about brand trust. Never. 
okay. it's 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 basically that sentiment of people trying to fo- to to fall in love with your brand, to engage with your brand, to be passionate about about your brand, you know, uh, which most of the brands uh, it it's their goal. Um, yeah. But then. Uh, a few years uh, ago, um, we started understanding that um, brand love uh, is just one portion. It's one piece, you know, like people to actually um, love your brand, they, they need to trust your actions, you know, and to know that the brand is doing the right things. Um, because it's easy, it's really easy to say, oh, oh this, this is an amazing brand. There are, uh, this is an amazing brand and there, there are fans all over the world. But then they have so many issues that people start pointing and like, so ultimately um, brand trust is what led up to uh, to brand love, you know, um, a, a brand such as Patagonia, again, using them as an example, because why not? They, they are the ones pushing uh, this sector, you know, like, and um, they are the role models on that sense. Like uh, they, they managed to do something that uh, no other brand uh, did yet, which is their consumers purchase their their products because they trust their actions, you know, and they know that everything they are doing is the right thing, from the materials they use to paying fairly this the uh, um, their, their employees in every country they are to all the supply chain um, to their design and everything. So and that makes people love the brand, but it's built on trust. And, and I think that's that's the kind of rational. It's like we need to build trust to get to uh, a true brand love, you know? Mm-hmm. Absolutely, I really like that. So one thing cannot happen without the other, basically. Yeah, uh, I, I, I feel that um, there, there's a false sentiment of brand love and superficial uh, sentiment sometimes of brand love, but the true brand love uh, I feel it's built with uh, people actually trusting trusting your brands and trusting your actions. Exactly, and that happens through transparency from brands, isn't it? Yes, definitely. Yeah. I think the more transparency you are with your 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 issues, the better. Like uh, people are people are smart, you know. Like they 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 know the deal. They know when you are green washing, and they know you are, when you are purples washing, uh, as, as a new term people are using. Um, they, they just need to do a little research. So well, we need to be extremely careful in everything that we do and to, to make sure it's done with the right intentions and, um, uh, and, 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 that, and, and that we are doing for a better purpose. Mm-hmm. So on that note of transparency from brands, is there a specific way that you um, advise brands to be transparent with, the, with their products or services? I think this this part maybe maybe I can take this Zaro. Yeah, I think this ahead. part is a this part is a very tricky part because sometimes we are the ones with a amazing challenge uh, from the brand like in a surface level, and then we need to do the work of uh, curating and, and researching. You know, like um, I remember that a couple of months ago we started with a. A, a relationship with a great client doing like a a, a great uh, product and then after a month of work we were going deeper and deeper and deeper on the on the narrative and we realized that there was like a big issue with the with this company you know and we just found ourselves after a month of work that we needed to uh, fire the client and we just lost a whole month of revenue and it was a very hard decision but the the right decision for us to make and you know it 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 also comes up to this trailblazing thing that that is like there will be a lot of moments that we will just bang our heads in the wall and and lose a whole month of revenue but if we don't do this i th- i think there's no other way i think we need to find better ways to background check the clients the campaigns and in every uh, like beyond the surface level but I, I don't think there's another way to build this with substance you know so on the topic of outsourcing a creative agency i don't know if you know this but design rush has a directory of the top creative agencies globally 
and outsourcing creative agencies has become an increasingly prevalent in the advertising industry, as you guys know. So on that note, what are your thoughts on the importance of outsourcing and how can it be a benefit for both the client and the agency? I think with the with the landscape of, you know, the 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 big picture of the business, like I think like moving from these models of uh, AOR to rosters and, and and everything that is happening in the last five years it's really hard to to make it happen with full time employees all, all the time so right now we are just like finding this balance between full time freelancers and outsourcing uh, agencies and vendors and and sometimes even uh, capabilities like design you know it's it's really important to read the room right now um, and and build different structures that are not necessarily based on 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 full-time employees all the time i think right now what we have here at akkway bloom is sort of a mix between maybe 70 percent of full-time employees and the rest is the room that we have to breathe you know to expand and contract so um i think we are designing a, a model here that is um maybe more effective in this sense and gives us more space to to consider the the short and mid-term actions you know sure yeah that makes sense uh, i think okay. it also if i if i may add quickly uh, it, it, it's not only about uh, uh um capacity and um uh like skills it's it's also about understanding that we we don't know everything you know and sometimes we need to source um uh that information and that capacity somewhere else uh so it's not only about getting oh we need a designer here to help with this with this work but sometimes yeah. people with uh, with their speci the specific skills to that brief you know that will add something that we don't have you know uh, some uh, a personal vision or an experience or uh, social work that they do uh, and we have been doing this uh, here and there and, it, and it's very helpful yeah and, and, the, and the problems are becoming more and more complex you know and, and they, they are requiring more like a different solution not only for every client but for every project and I think us uh, AKQA working as a network here in the US for example with seven uh, different studios it gives us a much a uh, more interesting range of diversity when it comes to maybe we won't approach this client or this specific project only within uh, Bloom, but we will outsource it uh, with other studios or other agencies or other uh, or freelance workers. So we have like a more accurate balance uh, of different backgrounds, different skills, different uh, everything, you know. Absolutely. So it's kind of like a melting pot of talent that you guys kind of collect together then. For every different project, you know. Amazing. That's fantastic. So, okay. It would also be quite interesting to know how AKQA Bloom navigates the balance between purpose-driven work and the need to generate revenue for clients. So are there certain criteria or values that guide your decision-making process when it comes to choosing the right projects and clients you work with? I think I think that um, uh, also we we briefly spoke about um, wh when we talk about our credentials deck uh, we have um, a specific chapter that says that um, our best business results were actually coming from uh, campaigns that we did with uh, some kind of purpose related to it uh, social or environmental so um, I think that's th that's our business vision for. Um, um, for for Bloom and the clients we work with, you know, like because we have proved in the past that doing the right thing is better for the business. I mean, the right thing having a positive impact on people's lives, the society or the environment leads up to better business results for those brands. So I yeah. think that's the na the narrative we try to push to our clients, showing examples of the work that we did in the past um, that prove. That that's a reality, um, and so I think that the two things are extremely connected. You know, like because mm -hmm. for our experience, 
doing what we are doing right now and focusing the work that we are focused is better for the business in general. Yeah, I, I think it's it's all it's almost hard to talk about a balance, you know, between the the short term um, business results and everything because you know the profit is the the oxygen of every company, so it, it's never out of the equation. It's just like a I think our balance here is first to be agents of the record and to do everything like from short term, mid term, long term, e-commerce, everything for those brands that are uh, connected from the beginning uh, to like this bigger sense of purpose. And then when it comes to the doing only the purpose related part of this, it might sound at first as something that is not related to low, uh, short t- term sales, you know, but it is at the end of the day, you know, like being ahead of the curve of, um, you know, uh, the consumer opinion, the regulations and everything that uh, will be related automatically to social and environmental purpose is critical for, for these big companies. And they, they are looking for these and, and they come to us trying to solve these challenges. Yeah. Okay. But like, is there a specific criteria that you guys look at when it comes to certain companies that you work with or clients or projects? Is there anything like boxes that you need to check off? Uh, because I know that you guys are, you have courage and you say no to certain clients that you don't want to work with necessarily. So, I mean, there must be boxes they have to check. Yeah. Uh, Zalo, maybe, maybe I can start with a, with an interesting yeah, practical example here. Like, yeah. Just, just the case that we decided to invest and, and, and build our relationship with Coca-Cola in new, in new terms, working only with uh, returnables as an example. I think it's, it's when, when, we, when, we, when it comes to this space, then it's everything about, uh, you know, the, the, the traditional approach of scaling a solution like returnables that changing a consumer habit, like trying to understand by research what is holding on, uh, you know, the consumer to buy the, the returnable bottle instead of the single use plastic bottle. Then when we are w- within this small space, everything is the same logic, you know, so how can we build uh, under returnables? But, you know, when it comes to Volvo, for example, we are 100% focused on electric cars. And it's not too different, you know, to sell an electric car compared to a fossil fuel or fuel engine. So it's just like a, a smaller space we are, we are, we are bringing. But uh, when, it, when we are inside this space, the logic um, is pretty much the same. Okay. Yeah, I, I and I, if I may just add, um, we analyze case by case. To, to be super honest, like just as Paul was saying, there was this client uh, last year that they had an amazing product with an amazing environmental impact, but later on we discovered really really bad stuff from 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 this client. So we pull it off, you know. Like so, um, it's really hard to. We, 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 do, we don't have like a checklist, so uh, we analyze case by case, but we try, uh, I think our metrics, like we try to understand uh, if the impact of, of what we are doing um, is, is good enough uh, compared to, to all the, the bad stuff that the, this client might, might, have, might, might have, you know, and it's impossible to be perfect. We, we won't be like, even, even for, uh, I'm pretty sure we will launch many campaigns and people will come and point their fingers up, pointing problems. And we, and we acknowledge that. Like, uh, uh, I think Bloom was never intended to be perfect, you know, like to do, oh, we only work with perfect clients who are doing everything right. No, we are surrounded by issues just like our planet is and our society is. And we're trying to improve here and there and do better uh, in, in different cases and different situations. Um, uh, Maybe we'll do an amazing social campaign for a brand, but that brand is not really environmental friendly. Okay. It's like, you know, like it's, it's really, really hard to find the balance, but um, we need to understand um, if it's worth it, if the positive impact of that specific action um, 
is is worth our time and our investment. A hundred percent. Okay. So, okay, just quickly, um, on that note, if you do say, for instance, like with this client or any other clients, if you do come across one that you feel um, doesn't really suit your mission and values and what you guys stand for as an ad agency, um, how do you kind of, I don't want to say reject, but basically say no to them? Um, or how do you explain to them that you guys aren't really the right fit and they might need to go to another agency? Like, what does that look like? I think it all starts with the, with the, uh, with the approach of the client. And sometimes um, we feel like the clients are seeing us as um, an agency more towards sustainability and environmental, you, you know, uh, on this space when we are up to do everything that is... Um, you know, it's broader th than this. And even the concept of sustainability, we are finding out that it's not just a uh, narrowed and uh, it's not something related to, to the environment and, and sustainability is everything. And when we have a client that is not getting 100% of our mission and comes to approach to, to a challenge that is, that is not necessarily what we are trying to do as an agency, we try to go deeper on their business challenges and, and, and then extract what is the real problem that they are trying to solve in, 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 com in communications. And workshopping a little bit further this, it's really easy to find the, the right answer, you know, and, and then sometimes it, uh, it ends up on not moving forward with the project and, and eventually they will reach out to us after a year, you know, and uh, a little bit more prepared to this. But it's been pretty common that we are rejecting some, some work sometimes, but it's not necessarily rejecting. It's more like walking with the client uh, to, to say that, okay, maybe you are trying to communicate or to talk about something that you are not prepared to do this. And you have, you have like a three years uh, walk before you can consider doing this and then they realize and they try to 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 and maybe eventually they will uh try to focus on solving the problem or doing some right thing first and then being able to to communicate this you know oh my word i love that so basically you kind of help clients that you might not necessarily necessarily work with now you help them to build their company so that they can actually enact change and what they're saying through the activities you create for them would be more true. Yeah. And I think this is the balance that we are trying to build between a consultancy capacity and an ambitious creative outcome because the, the ambitious creative outcome, we have proven that we, that we could tackle every brief and come up with an amazing idea. But what about this, this um, deeper level of coming up to a client and say, you are not prepared to do this. Uh, like you might think you have a solution for this. You might think you are, you can talk about this all over the place, but don't do it. You know, like um, what if you do this instead? What if you, uh, what if you invest on, on something and you don't even communicate this and then in three years, or two, maybe even one, you are prepared to talk about this, but like this, not like that, you know? Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Really. Color me impressed, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. Lastly, for young creatives aspiring to make a name for themselves in the advertising industry, what would your advice be right now, based on your own journey and success, for them to be successful in the industry? Maybe, Fernando, you can start. Sure. Um, uh, I don't think there's, a, a again, a, a formula or like a, a one way to do it. Um, uh, people, they have different paths, you know, like, and they achieve success through, through different ways. Um, the way that we know is... Uh, working working super hard and not giving up being super resilient um but uh 
above everything is believing in what we are doing you know like uh, having having like this clear mindset and a clear sense on, on where you want to go uh, I think that's extremely important to help you um, get get there you know um, for us uh, we, we learned this uh, as we were going through first moving to Portugal and then moving to Argentina and then moving back to Brazil <laughs> like you know like there were many different ways of um, doing things to be where we are uh, today but w- w- the only thing that doesn't change is the drive you know um, so I think that that applies to everyone and th- there is a famous quote I-, I don't remember who said that but like if you if you put a, uh, if you put a bunch of people in a room um, uh, talented uh, h- hard work we will always beat talent you know um, and and I and I fully agree with that um uh, of course if you are extremely talented and extremely hard work there then you are god you know but like um th- there's always a way for you to learn and improve and to get better so and, and I, i truly believe that hard work beats talent because uh it, it's it's the mindset and the drive you know and there is one thing you say Zalo, is that uh, you can't guarantee that you'll be the you'll be the most talented person oh, in the room yes. but you can guarantee that you'll be the most you'll be the most uh, hard worker hard worker and and i think yeah. this is what this is also a lesson that i uh, that i learn every day with Zalo, uh, and i think we are in, in this place of understanding on this generational shifts and and the place we are right now we see this sentiment of some people maybe giving up on on um on um on on a workplace because they have been in this place for like six months already and they didn't bring any impact you know and then let's move to the next one but i think over the years we are just realizing that it's it's something that you build every day and it takes decades you know for you to say that okay now we are starting to build something in our case here for example something that can be a platform for for the younger generations to understand that they can work on with the things they love uh with with their creativity but towards uh, a more positive impact uh in the world and sometimes it takes years decades you know to to realize that we are starting something and maybe we won't be able to accomplish uh half of the things that we are trying but at least we are going to uh maybe inspire like this this new generations you know exactly and i think in any case you know any change isn't going to happen overnight it's going to be generational as it always has been And I think it's amazing that you guys are both doing this with that in mind. And you're really going for it. You know, you're really, really doing the thing. And it's amazing. So really, thank you so much for joining us today. It's mm-hmm. been oh, an amazing conversation. I've, I've had the best time, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've learned a lot. And it's just really, really incredible to see that there are people out there that are doing really good work and fighting for it every single day. Thank you for everything that you guys are doing. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Really appreciate Great the time and the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a wrap for today's episode. What an inspiring conversation and certainly many noteworthy topics to consider. Prioritizing transparency, delivering on promises, and consistently exceeding expectations can build brand trust that stands the test of time. And when you infuse your brand with authenticity, empathy, and a genuine passion for your customers' needs, you can cultivate a deep sense of loyalty and love. If you're looking for a reliable creative agency to bring your vision to life, visit designrush.com slash marketplace. Our marketplace offers a curated selection of agencies that can provide the solutions you need to turn your dream campaign into a reality. Again, I'm your host, Bianca Mayer. Stay curious and join us for the next episode.